Hi, I'm Robert from ExoPolitics Germany. With Frederick from ExoPolitics Denmark. And we are sitting here with George Knapp, a man who actually wrote UFO history and who's actually a part of UFO history himself. You created part of UFO history. Welcome, George. Thank you. You're making me sound old. Well, <laughs> I'm making you the trying to put you in that historical uh, context that you that you actually came up with, Area 51. You're responsible for setting that term into the world. Isn't that a heavy burden? Don't you feel a little? <laughs> yeah. Well, it goes. It it varies between whether I should be blamed for it or accept or, or be prideful of it. I I think it's a little bit of both. You know, I think uh, probably the. The people out there wish that it had never happened, the people who run the base, because we've created so many problems for them. Since those stories first aired in 1989, 25 years ago, uh, tens of thousands of people have gone out to the base to see whatever it is that's flying around out there. Every news organization in the world has sent cameras and crews. Government investigators have gone there. It shined a light on government secrecy, black projects that had never been made possible before. There are those who say, maybe the government uh, created these stories, that they leaked them to me and I did their bidding uh, because they wanted to focus uh, the focus to be something away from what they really do out there and on UFOs, which is ridiculous. And to those folks, I say, anyone who had that plan in mind really screwed up because as a result of the UFO stories, uh, you know, so much attention has been shined on Area 51. I'm proud of it. I, I am. I'm proud of it. Recently, you talked to Bob Lazar again, 25 years after uh, the main his main story broke out. How 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 did that come about again? I mean, how he's 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 been very reluctant to stepping forward. How how did that? Well, I you know I think I'm probably the only person in the world, the only interviewer who can get Bob to do that. He's sort of shied away from it. He's like to he'd like to leave that chapter of his life behind and because of the friendship that we've developed over the years, it's harder for him to ignore me. So I pestered him about it for quite some time and finally talked him into doing an interview for the 25th anniversary. Figured if there ever there was gonna be a time when he should sit down and talk about it in a contemplative sort of a way to think back on what has happened over a quarter century, uh, it would be now. And, and Bob is sort of of the same mind as I am, is that it, he's amazed that 25 years later, people are still talking about this. You know, I think we both knew that it was going to change his life when he when he came forward with this information, but had no idea it would it would change the world. I mean, that it would still be a topic of discussion a quarter of a century later. Bob, Bob Lazar is the one who who supposedly worked at Area 51 with extraterrestrial craft recovered from the U.S. government, trying to rebuild their technologies. And um, what made you think that his story is true in the beginning? Well, uh, first is that just the way it sounds, Bob has a certain amount of credibility. I mean, he just, he doesn't try to uh, exaggerate. He keeps it, I mean, it's a fantastic story any way you look at it, but uh, his story has stayed the same. It stayed consistent over the years. He never added extra stuff to it. That was number one. Number two is uh, I became convinced that there really was an effort to discredit him, to remove some of his records, to pretend that he never worked in places where I know he worked. I mean, we, uh, we can go into the details about it, but it was pretty clear to me that someone was messing with his reputation. And thirdly, uh, is that if, if it had only been Bob telling this story about things that have been going on at S4 at Area 51, uh, chances are we would not have moved forward with the project. But the fact is that more than two dozen people have come forward with bits and pieces of the same information. People who have worked at Area 51 in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s who have told me Pretty much the same thing. People who have seen saucer-shaped craft out there in hangars, saucer-shaped craft flying uh, in, in the desert, um, being transported. Uh, people who say that what goes on out there is trying to figure out how this technology works so that we construct it, reconstruct it with earth materials instead of building something that we came up with the idea for. Where, where is the technology from exactly? Where do they have it from? Where did they recover it? I don't think anybody knows. I mean, I'm not sure even the people who run that program know. Bob said that he had read these briefing documents that suggested it was from another planet, a planetary system, uh, Zeta Reticuli. But the fact is, he, he, he is suspicious of these reports. He thinks that maybe they were telling him something just to, just to simplify it, as opposed to um, giving him the actual truth. I, I'm not quite sure anyone uh, knows where they came from. And in, on some levels, it does not make sense, because as he described the craft, 
these weren't shot down. These weren't craft that we had shot out of the sky and they're all crumpled up. He said they were the ones he saw, the nine craft were in, as far as he could tell, working order. They looked uh, solid. They weren't uh, in tatters. I think there was one of the craft that he said there was a great big hole shot through the middle, almost as if they did an experiment to see if art artillery could, could blow a hole in these things. But the sport model, which he saw fly, was in perfect working condition. It seems like someone just kind of gave them to us. Who that someone is, we don't really know. Could it, could it be that it actually, that Bob Lazar was used to, to plant actually a story into the public imagination about this? Uh, I mean, that's also yeah. a theory. Is yeah, that a possibility? Absolutely. And I've talked to Bob about that many times over the years. In the beginning, it was probably uh, kind of sensitive because, you know, he's got his life on the line. His life was in danger at some point, and he doesn't like to accept the idea that he was used as a pawn. Over the years, he's opened up to that possibility, and we both agree it's possible at some level. But as I said to you before, if the plan was, let's use Bob as a pawn to distract attention from something else that's going on at Area 51, then that plan is a miserable failure. Because as a result of Bob telling the story about the saucers, all those people came from all over the world. They're still going on out there. So if you wanted to fly a secret test aircraft of some sort, it's hard to do it because so much attention is focused. Every single day, there are people out there with cameras and binoculars looking in the sky to see what's going on. Because of Bob's story, every news organization in the world has been out there asking questions. Congressional investigators saying, hey, what's going on out here? How are you spending our money? Uh, you know, this is a lot of unwanted attention, and I can tell you they're not happy about it because they've told me. You know, we, we used to be followed around. These guys would follow us around, go to bars and restaurants. They'd, they'd follow all of us who were involved in, in telling that story. And a few of those guys, years later, after they got out of uh, working for that, those contractors, told us that that was their job. I would run into them in bars, and they told me, I was following you around. You know, they were, they were uh, checking us out, uh, putting us under, under scrutiny. And that also is another topic that's a sore spot with us. But, you know, if the plan was to uh, distract attention away from something else out there, it was a terrible, terrible failure. Uh, Bob accepts the idea that maybe he was used to some extent, and I have too, uh, that maybe someone, some faction inside the government, inside the Navy, wanted to see, let's run it up the flagpole and see if the public freaks out. If they knew that we had alien technology from somewhere else, how would the public react? And they picked a guy who could be discredited later. I mean, you look at him, he's not the first person you would think would be picked into the most secret program in the world. He's a smart guy, uh, and he, and he thinks unconventionally. So in one sense, he might be very qualified to come in with a fresh point of view, uh, because as Bob said, the technology had been out there for a while and they weren't making progress at all. Well, he came in and he gave them a fresh view and helped them gain a better understanding of what they had. Um, but he was not the top guy. He didn't have a PhD. He never claimed that. So why was he chosen? Well, I think he might have been chosen because he's a guy who could be discredited earlier. You let him tell that story, and then you pull the rug out from under him, you know? Because look, you look at him, you know, his, ha his house, he would fly a pirate flag over his house. Uh, he raced jet cars, have these gigantic jet cars in his, in his front yard. He liked hookers, prostitutes. Uh, he liked machine guns. He's a very unconventional guy, someone who, you got to figure, I, I wouldn't give him a security clearance because he, you, know, you never know when he's going to go off the deep end, do something crazy. He's rebellious by nature. He doesn't like authority, doesn't like taking orders. So you think he was given the security clearance in the first place because he was like that? Yeah, I do. I do think. In that sense, he might have been the most qualified person in the world for that job. He's smart, he's technically capable, he knows science, but he's a guy who could be destroyed in, the, in, in an in instant if you needed to pull the rug out from under him. Okay, could you summarize for us the biggest revelations coming from Bob Lazar? Bob Lazar says he was hired to work into this program that was under the auspices of the U.S. Navy, and he worked at a facility called S-4, south of Area 51 in Groom Lake, and that this facility was built in the side of a, a mountain that there was a series of hangars, nine different hangars, built into the side of this mountain designed to look like desert. In each one of these hangars was a saucer-like craft, a craft that was from somewhere else. Bob said that he was primarily working on the propulsion system, which he said was an anti-gravity propulsion system. The fuel is something called element 115, a heavy element 
at the time that he told that story in 1989, it did not exist. It has since been synthesized in much smaller pieces. Bob described it as a stable and heavy, um, and, and what we have synthesized now th does not match that description, but he thinks that maybe someday we might be able to get it. He thinks the fuel came from a binary star system where it was uh, an, in natural abundance. So he said he saw one of these craft being tested. Uh, he did a number of experiments on the anti-gravity reactor that were pretty much amazing. This thing could create its own gravitational field. And he says the way that the aliens could get to Earth is they create their own gravitational field and this gravity allows them to bend space and time. And instead of it propelling them forward, say they're on their planet and they want to get to Earth, instead of propelling them toward Earth, it would, in effect, pull Earth toward them. It would bend space and time, turn it off, and it goes back to normal, and you would be on Earth, but no time had gone by. Bob said that he read these briefing documents um, during the time he was out there that described uh, it had alien autopsy photos. It had information about uh, human beings that aliens were interested in our souls and possibly harvesting our souls. There was information that they had... Uh, they, they had been a part of humanity for, for centuries, that they had helped uh, engineer the human race, that there had been biomechanical engineering going on there, that they sort of had created us as a, as a special species. Um, very disturbing information about um, religious figures, uh, the nature of religion. Uh, so it, it's, quite a, it's quite a pile to chew on. Uh, yesterday you touched upon uh, a guy named Ben Rich, uh, who made a famous quote. Could you tell us a little bit about this and also the defense contractors and might they have uh, fancy technology? Ben Rich was the engineer and head of the Skunk Works, which is the, uh, the secret arm of Lockheed that has designed all the black projects, all the, the best secret airplanes in the world, the U-2, the SR-71, the A-12, stealth technology. Lockheed's did all, all that stuff and Ben Rich was overseeing all of those projects. If anyone outside of the U.S. government itself, any private contractor knew about recovered alien disks, it would be Ben Rich. That would be where it is. For a number of years, Ben would share little bits and pieces of information with his friends in the aviation community who also happened to be interested in UFOs. And some of those were guys that I got to know. So he would give them tantalizing little bits of information. They would ask him, what do you think about UFOs? And he has, in writing, said before, in letters that I got copies of, I believe in UFOs. I believe in two kinds of UFOs. I believe in unfunded opportunities, meaning black projects that had not yet been uh, put into the budget, and he believes in flying saucers from other, other places. Um, on the day that the stealth plane was unveiled to the world at Nellis Air Force Base, uh, I was there. I was one of the, the, the media people who was invited to go along for that event. And Ben Rich was standing out on the tarmac at Nellis, and I was able to interview him. And I asked him, uh, Mr. Rich, we've heard these stories that uh, maybe alien technology was incorporated into stealth. Uh, and he, he stopped, and he kind of chuckled and smiled, and he thought about it for a second. He said, no, no, just good old American technology. But the fact is, he's given other hints uh, since then that maybe that's not the full story, that maybe we got some help along the way. He made a statement, at least as reported, to a group at UCLA, an, an engineering audience, in which he said, we now have the capability to take ET home. We have the ability to travel to the stars right now. It's not something we have to dream up. If you can dream it up, we can already do it. Can we verify that statement? Well, uh, you know, it's been mul reported multiple times by, peop uh, by news media who were supposedly present. It has been told to me by people who are in the audience that that's what he said, whether or not the audio, there's a recording of it, I'm not quite sure. But I think when you take together all the other things that Ben Rich has said over the years, uh, then in fact, that is what he said. There was a guy, a friend of mine named Jim Goodall, who wrote a book about stealth technology. He's an aviation whiz, he's a friend of John Lear's, and he was one of the guys that would go out with Lear and a, and a group called the Interceptors to Area 51 to look in the sky to see whatever was flying around, secret planes, whatever. And they got onto the UFO story. Um, Jim Goodall was with Ben Rich days before he died in the hospital, and they talked about UFO interest. And he confirmed, yes, in fact, we do have that technology. But he said, it's so deep black. It's so far inside the black budget, it will never see the light of day. 
And that so, makes sense. So what are the implications? I mean, does it really mean that Star Trek is real, that some, you know, uh, hidden factions of the military or of the government are already flying among, around among the stars at the universe, meeting other civilizations? I, I don't know that they're, they're it, I would take it that far. I, I do think that, the, I think there's a strong possibility we do have a secret space program and that we are flying uh, at least among the stars or to other planets within our own uh, solar system, that it's a kind of program that is so far more advanced than what we see, space shuttles, ISS, that kind of stuff, that it goes far beyond that. I, there, there are several indications that, that there really is a space program like that, not the least of which is what, what ben, ben Rich had said. I, I don't think that there's any Star Trek, we've got a, a, a cosmic federation that's meeting with other alien beings or something like that, but, but I don't really know. I, I just don't think it goes that far. There is another whistle, a supposed whistleblower named uh, Colonel Philip Corso, I, I think you also met him, um, uh, who has a, a similar story. I was, the first, I was the first journalist, UFO journalist, to interview Colonel Corso. Uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, had been working with him about prisoners of war. Colonel Corso had made dramatic, seemingly unsupported statements in the past on other topics, and it had been proven to be true. He said that we Americans had left behind a number of prisoners of war in both World War II and Korea and then in the Vietnam conflict. And that was very controversial when he said it, but as history has shown us, he was right. Well, a friend of mine who was working on the story about prisoners of war was talking to Colonel Corso and, and heard this story about the UFO information. He shared it with me. I met with Corso. Now the rest of the world knows his story. But back then, I had a deal. I was going to write his book. Uh, it, it didn't work out that way. Someone, someone else intervened. But Corso had said that he was stationed at the Pentagon, He was in a special office that dealt with foreign technology that would figure out ways to, stuff that we had acquired from Russians or other places, advanced technology, figure out a way to get it into the private sector, have them duplicate that technology, and then filter it out into places where it can be used. And he said that there was a drawer. There was a drawer of technology from a, a recovered flying saucer, an alien disk, that we didn't quite know how to deal with it, but eventually... He said that it was his job to hand it out to Bell Labs and other big think tanks, and they figured out uh, how to use it, how to duplicate it. Uh, fiber optics technology, he says, night vision goggles, a number of other things uh, were given a boost along the way by this stuff that was recovered from uh, Flying Saucer. And it's a fantastic story, and a lot of people don't believe it. But the fact is, Philip Corso was in that job. Uh, he really did work for a general who was in that position. That if there had been recovered material, that's where it would have gone. Um, whether or not we're ever going to be able to verify it for sure, I, I guess we probably need to find the, the material itself uh, to satisfy everyone's curiosity. But Philip Corso had said that he had some extraordinary experiences in his life, separate from his job at the Pentagon, that he had encounters with aliens, and that uh, basically the story uh, it coincides to a large degree with the, the story told by Bob Lazar. Yeah, I was about to ask that. Do you think he's credible? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, he, he really, I, I think the problem is that as, a, as he grew older, maybe some of the stories and experiences in his life got grander with the passage of time, just a matter of ego. But I, th I think he was telling the truth. I, I think Philip Corso was telling the truth as he knew it. There is a guy named Bob Bigelow. Uh, can you tell us a little about him? About him? What his, what's his role in all this? Bob Bigelow is a great man in my estimation, but he's somebody who is a, an enigma in the UFO field. People assume the worst about him. He's a wealthy businessman in Las Vegas. I think probably at one point he was worth about $2 billion, dollars, and he's had a lifelong interest in UFOs because his family, he and his family, had seen them at a young, when he was a young boy. So as he became wealthy and successful, he wanted to put a lot of his resources into UFO research, and he has. Bob Bigelow has spent more money on UFO research than any person in the history of the world. And he's done it quietly for the most part over the years. He would dish out grants to researchers, people like Linda Howe, Stanton Friedman, uh, and others, hoping that his money would provide the kind of financial support that UFO researchers do not get. He's given uh, a lot of money to UFO organizations, MUFON and KUFOs. I think he put a million dollars on the table at one point, hoping that the three major American groups would get together, 
that they would figure out a good way to spend the money and maybe get some answers about UFOs, which did not happen. Uh, because of that, dis uh, Bob was dissatisfied with how those organizations were doing their work. He created his own. It was called NIDS, the National Institute for Discovery Science. And he put together a world-class science advisory board consisting of people who had been top-notch scientists, who some of whom had worked for the CIA and other government agencies or the military, who had an interest in UFOs while they were working for the military and who tried to get answers while they were in the inside but could not. And in addition to those kind of people, he put together people like Jacques Vallée, John Alexander, a lot of others who'd been on the periphery of, of these subject matters, but academics with impeccable credentials. That's a science advisory board. The, the second part of NIDS was a component that was a rapid recovery team. If you have a UFO crash, if you have a, uh, a series of uh, sightings, if you have a series of cattle mutilations, they would be able to jump on a plane, take a bunch of equipment, and go there to the scene to investigate boots on the ground. It was a tremendous... Uh, uh, opportunity to gather solid information about UFO cases and, and incidents. And, and for a long time, it, it worked. For seven, eight, nine years, it, it worked. And he collected a great deal of information. He also bought databases from uh, other researchers, put it all together, hoping to compile it to get, to get some ultimate answers. But did, did they get answers? Did they draw some conclusions? Or I, I don't think so. Uh, the, the problems, it, it's sort of the same problems that apply to ufology and scientists in general applied to them. There's no place that they could publish the work. You know, there, there's no place, there's no science journal that would accept uh, papers about these topics, even though they were written by qualified people. So ultimately, I don't think so. And it's generated, the result is it's generated so much controversy and speculation. What are these guys up to? They're trying to corner the market on UFO technology. They're trying to build their own flying saucers and take over the world. I've heard so many ridiculous stories about Bigelow, that he's uh, in the mafia, that he sells drugs, that he has the Bigelow Tea Company, that he works for the CIA, uh, all kinds of stuff, because he was always reluctant to give interviews. Until he did an interview with me a couple of years ago about his space program, he'd never been on television. And there was a reason for that. It's nothing mysterious, is that he's a wealthy man. He wanted to be able to go out and have dinner with his wife and not be pestered by people who wanted to borrow money from him or worry about his grandchildren being kidnapped for ransom, things of that sort. So he didn't want to go on camera. Uh, that changed when he went in to develop his own space program. But um, you know, you, you know what it's like, the UFO field, and the kinds of rampant rumors and speculation that takes place. So all kinds of stories have been told about Bob, about the people who work with him, when in fact all they wanted to do was the same stuff we want to do, which is get information and get answers. And uh, I think he's been pilloried unfairly. Uh, I do think he's a great man. What he's doing now in the, in the area of uh, creating space habitat, habitat is gonna change the world. What is, uh, what is it all about? Bob uh, came up with an idea about 15 years ago to take over a NASA program called Expandable Space Habitat, inflatable uh, spacecraft. Uh, NASA had, to, had done some work on it and then abandoned it like they do with so many projects. And Bob said, I like that idea. He bought the, the patent rights to it, hired his own team of experts and, and developed it further. He has basically launched his own space program in Las Vegas. Bob Bigelow reports to one person. One person is his boss and that's his wife. And he went to her about 15 years ago and he said, honey, I want, to, I want to build my own space program. I want to go to the stars. I want to be on the cutting edge of privatization of space, commercial development of space. He wanted to commit $500 million of his own money to it, and that's what he's done. And in, in the last 12 years, it's an amazing development. I mean, he has two spacecraft up there in the sky right now. He built them, built his own plant, hired his own team, um, designed these things, and then hired the, the Russians to launch these craft up there. He had a timetable of uh, sending up bigger and bigger inflatable craft over the years until he gets to a really big one. But it went so well, those first two craft, that he decided to skip the interim steps and go right to a big one. Um, Bob Bigelow next year will begin putting together his own space station, and it will be larger than the ISS. His inflatable uh, habitats are stronger and safer and will provide more space in space. And once he has it up there in place, he'll lease it out or even sell it to foreign governments, 
to our government, to corporations, so we can do business up there. And I think once private enterprise gets a foothold in space, it changes everything. Uh, it, there will be bases on the moon, there will be bases on Mars. Once the profit motive kicks in, and it's not governments just putting footing the bill for this, uh, it, it, it's going to be an amazing transformation, and it'll, it'll happen fast. And it will and, be an incredible return of investment, making even well, richer, I hope so, right? Because he's, he's spent about $400 million so far. He got one government contract that was with NASA for $17 million, and they paid him to put one of his, basically it's to build a closet on the ISS and to launch it up there so they have uh, storage space on the ISS. As a result of that successful uh, deal, uh, which was made public about a year ago, Bob now finds himself at the center of the future of the space program. NASA has made him sort of the clearinghouse for all other projects and contractors. So if Boeing wants to talk to NASA about putting something private in space, they have to go through Bob. It's an amazing spot to be in. It's yeah, a, it's, an, it's, it's an amazing position to be in. It's a heck of a business move on his part because whatever happens in the development of space now is going to have to go through Bob Bigelow. And it drives people crazy. Oh my gosh, that UFO cover-up guy. <laughs> he's in charge of, uh, he's now in charge of space. What else is he up to? It's like, you know, at Skinwalker Ranch, people had written that Bob Bigelow has recovered a flying disc. He's got secret technology. He will rule the world, uh, you know. Uh, but I mean, is it really only due to his, uh, you know, uh, development of an ISS closet that puts him into such a powerful, powerful position? Well, I mean, yeah, I, th I think that is. I mean, he saw an opportunity that no one else had uh, realized, and he had the resources to go after it. And there aren't many people in the world that can write a check for $350, $400 million, and Bob did. Or if they could, so you, you look at somebody like Boeing. Boeing still exists on the, la on the old paradigm that give me a billion dollars and I'll build something and maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. Uh, the, our space program, the American space program, is, is ridiculous. It's done nothing for years. We don't even have a way to get to the ISS. We spent $100 billion building it. We don't have a way to get there anymore. The space shuttle is shut down. We have to rely on the Russians who, to pay them exorbitant rates to get to our own space Station. It's ridiculous. Is still less expensive than the American space shuttle starts. Yeah, I, you know, NASA is a jobs program. It mostly consists of job security. You, you put money in, they start a program up, it goes for a couple of years, and then they cancel it. I, it they've done it over and over again. It, it is shameful. And it needs private enterprise to go ahead and, and take, take the next step because the government model does not work. And Bob Bigelow finds himself at the cusp of... Uh, of a, a brave new era of space exploration and development. You're a, a journalist, just to talk about the journalistic view of this, you've been based in, in, in Las Vegas most of your career, and it's been, a, I guess, a very, very spe special place for you to be because they will be able to, there are some, it's an exotic place, a lot of things, lots of stories going on, and you've been able to cover some of these more, these exotic stories uh, in that particular place. Uh, but how would you describe your career with, with this topic? How, what's been the reaction of your, your colleagues uh, when you've gone into this field? It, it's been a mixed bag. I mean, in general, uh, because I was successful, I was fairly well thought of in my profession at KLAS, and I'd been there for 10 years before I jumped into this. I think I'm able to get away with things that otherwise would not have been possible. And I don't think... Uh, it would be, it's, it'd be hard for anybody else in, in the USA to duplicate it because most reporters are in the, into the business. You get a new assignment every day. Go cover the city council meeting. There's a bank robbery. Go do that. I had a special niche. I was able to cover stories that interested me. My boss gave me that opportunity. So when the UFO thing came up and Area 51 is in our backyard, they said, go for it. And they trusted me to do a good job. And I've tried to approach this topic, as exotic as it is, like I would approach any other story. Um, you know, to verify information, to find credible sources of information, to, uh, you know, to back it up, to get supporting materials. And so because I've tried to do it that way, they've given me a great deal of latitude. It has driven my colleagues, though, crazy, as I was saying in a presentation recently. Um, my journalism colleagues don't like it. They don't like it that it's, it's so popular uh, with the public, that there's so much public interest. Uh, so they belittle it, they make wisecracks, they poke fun at it. A lot of that has been aimed at me. 
I don't mind. I'm not thin-skinned. It comes with the territory. In my hometown, I have a high-profile uh, public position, so I I'm fine with it. But it what bothers me is that so many people would, uh, in the journalism field would dismiss this topic outright without doing any work on it. They don't do the groundwork. If you were to tell me, I don't believe UFOs are real, it's a bunch of nonsense, because you've done the research, you've read the books, that's one thing. But to say, to dismiss it with a wave of your hand, having done no work whatsoever, that's another. It goes contrary to everything that journalism is supposed to stand for. We're supposed to investigate the unexplained, not to explain the uninvestigated. Many years ago, you stumbled across the so-called Majestic 12 documents. Uh, have you thoroughly investigated them as well? Not really. I mean, I've, I've done some work on them, and uh, I've relied on people like Stanton Friedman. I, I think it's still in my gray basket, MJ-12 documents. I tend to think that they were probably created by a government intelligence agency. Can you tell us about what's written in those documents? The MJ-12 documents uh, suggest that there was a secret organization, Majestic 12, that was put together as sort of a clearinghouse for all information about UFOs. Crashed saucers, alien visitations, things of that sort. Uh, that there would be w this one group that would report to the president, kept keep things very hush-hush and all compartmentalized so that it didn't get out and up upset the public. Um, the makeup of MJ-12 is, is, has always been a, a source of some uh, mystery. Uh, who was on the board? We, we've got some guesses about who they were. When the MJ-12 documents appeared in somebody's mailbox, they sort of laid it out. They identified who the members of MJ-12 were, what the purpose was, Uh, it, it, these documents suggested that we had recovered disks, that there had been uh, ongoing communications with aliens, very controversial stuff. Uh, a guy named Stanton Friedman, a uh, nuclear physicist, has sort of taken the lead in investigating these documents and trying to verify them. He believes uh, that they are true, that they are accurate, because they revealed certain things about individuals who were named as members of MJ-12, They revealed things about those people who had, that had never been made public before and that, in fact, have been confirmed. Um, if you were to ask me, I'd, I, I'd say that probably 90% of ufologists, American ufologists, believe that those documents are not legitimate in this sense. That and why? Um, there's a variety of problems with it, uh, you know, ver both in, in format and dates, in references to things that are in the documents that were were not uh, public information back then, were, may not have even been known. Uh, terms like EBE, you know, that, that, that those are, are, are mentioned in the MJ-12 documents. I, I haven't read them in a while. The, the how, I think the, the primary problem with them is how they were acquired, that they showed up in the mailbox of a couple of researchers. Those researchers have since admitted, at least one of them did, admitted that they made up a bunch of stuff, that they worked for the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, and that they, um, they had manufactured material and fed it to UFO researchers just to see uh, how, how it would spread, even though it was false information. Um, so I, why I, do you think a government agency would, would spread this kind of information? Uh, well, one reason would be to see how it spreads, to figure out how quickly, you know, how, how things spread. This is pre-internet uh, when, it, when it spread out, to see who would believe it and who wouldn't. And who works um, with whom. And yeah. I think it was an exercise in intelligence. It would be to see, for example, it might have been created to distract the Russians. Uh, the, whoever did this stuff is really good at it. I mean, they have so much information in there, and it is so close to the real thing that whoever manufactured them, they really knew their stuff, which is why a lot of people suspect it was created as a distraction for the Russians. Make the Russians think that we've got recovered flying saucers. Make them worry about it. Because the Russians have said that, and then they, they've done the same thing. Now that we're talking about the Russians, you also un uh, discovered or you, you, you got hold of uh, former KGB documents. What do the Russians know about this? This is an interesting chapter in, our, in my life, and I, I didn't, it came out of the nowhere. Uh, in 1992, I left KLAS TV. I worked for a company called Altamira Communications. And this company had its own TV studio. And the idea was I would leave television uh, to produce my own stuff. I had proposed to this company that we produce a series of UFO documentaries, that the research would become self-supporting, 
that we would cover it in ways that no one had ever covered it before. So we traveled the world and collected information. We went to England and chased crop circles. We went all over the United States uh, dealing with cattle mutilations. I interviewed all of the best uh, UFO authorities in the world and collected all this data. And along the way, uh, we were wondering about Russia because I, I read an article in the New York Times about Lee Harvey Oswald's KGB file. And the, the KGB had opened this file up and what it revealed about Oswald, I don't even remember what it was, but I remember thinking, oh my gosh, if somebody could access uh, their file about Oswald, what do they have about UFOs? If they are like the United States, they've had their own UFO studies. Clearly they see these things in the sky the same as we do. No one had ever got that information. We always had a, a, a hint or a hope that maybe the files existed, but I thought to myself, well, there's a window of opportunity because of glasnost, perestroika, maybe we could get into Russia and learn more from the Russians about what the Americans know than we would ever learn from the Americans themselves. And in fact, that's what we did. I met a physicist named Dr. Nikolai Kapranov, who was in the United States. He was touring uh, American think tanks and nuclear facilities, giving lectures on disarmament, nuclear di disarmament. Uh, Nikolai had been a national security advisor to the Russian parliament, he was also a national security advisor to Boris Yeltsin. And uh, because of that, he traveled in some really interesting circles. At the end of his tour, he ended up in Las Vegas. And a United States Congressman, Jim Bilbray, said, you ought to meet this guy. Uh, he might know something about UFOs, because Bilbray knew that we were working on a project. So I went out for beers with Dr. Kapranov. Hey, let's, what do you know about UFOs? Ah, I don't know anything. Never heard. You never hear anybody talking about it? Nah, not really. Not the KGB or anything. Couple more beers. You know, I did, I did have a friend of mine in KGB who said something about UFO studies. And then as we sit there a little longer, you know what, there's a guy at the Ministry of Defense who knows something about this. I said, Nikolai, would you be interested in working for us? We set you up, give you a stipend, you go back to Russia and work for us. And he was happy to do it because he had no idea what else he would be doing with his life. So for the next eight months, parts of 92 into 93, Nikolai met with Russians who were in high positions of authority. My instruction to him was this, very simple. I don't want anyone who has ever talked to the media about UFOs before. I don't want to have anybody who's ever come forward with this. I want you to find people who are in a position to know who have never talked about it. And that's what he did. And the, the key person that he found, I mean, in the spring of 93, we went to Moscow to meet the people that he had set up for us. The key finding was a guy named Colonel Boris Sokolov. Colonel Sokolov was from a long, distinguished military family. He was a highly decorated guy, and he was in charge of an office within the Russian Ministry of Defense that handled foreign technology. And he was the head of what is the most extraordinary UFO study in the history of the world. The biggest UFO study in history will never be duplicated. The order went out. Uh, let me back up. There had been an incident in Petrozavodsk, uh, and the Russian government was concerned about it, a UFO incident. What the heck happened here? So they started a study, and Colonel Sokolov was in charge of it. The order went out to every military unit in the vast Soviet military empire. Every UFO sighting, every ball of light, every anomalous aircraft, anything weird, it has to be fully investigated, and that information all goes to one central place. And the place it ended up was on Sokolov's desk. Tens of thousands of cases were reported over the years. All of them reported by military witnesses, officers and above, and were meticulously documented. Witness statements, photographs, drawings, it all went to Sokolov. And, uh, and it was an amazing treasure trove. He had never spoken about it before. When I found him, he's living in a, in a tiny little apartment on a government pension. And I asked him about it, and he was very open, uh, and the stories he told me were absolutely fantastic, and with his help, we were able to acquire several hundred pages of this material. What did he tell you? He what did me, they know? What did they he actually said, know? He uh, said, as with United States, he could, Colonel Sokolov confirmed all of the things that we have always suspected about the American government. He told us they are true. That, uh, w that UFOs have been visiting the planet for a long time, that they are from somewhere else, that this technology can fly circles around anything that exists, 
The Russians knew that these craft are not Americans. He said, you Americans know that the craft are not Russians, that they come from somewhere else. And he said, it's a very simple reason why they did this study. He said, your stealth technology, you were so far ahead of us in stealth, we knew that UFOs could do things that our aircraft could not. If we could duplicate that technology, we would be superior to you in stealth. So the Russians had a very practical reason for doing this study. And he said 90% of these cases could probably be explained, which is similar to what we ufologists know about it. You know, 90% uh, of them can be explained. It's the other 10% that are interesting. And those cases were very dramatic. He said there had been more than 40 uh, incidents where Russian warplanes encountered UFOs. They were ordered to chase them, that these UFOs appeared in restricted airspace. The Russian warplanes would chase them. Mostly the UFOs would disappear. They'd just vanish. Or they'd perform some maneuver, sail right out of space in an instant, and nothing could be done. There were three instances where Russian warplanes, the standing order was to start firing on UFOs. He said, there are three instances where we fired on them, and in two of those cases, our pilots were shot down and killed. So after those two pilots were killed, they changed the order, leave UFOs alone. Because in, in the words of the Russian uh, defense minister, they said, UFOs seem to have the ca capability, retaliatory capability beyond anything we have. Leave them alone. And all the pilots were happy to go along with that order, <laughs> Sokolov said. He showed me photographs of Russian warplanes that had hit struck UFOs, the wings had been damaged. He said that they had transferred a lot of their files to their Russian Academy of Sciences to try to figure out how these things worked. He introduced me to uh, the head of the Russia's Star Wars program. This guy had on his desk, he had a, a desk-sized laser weapon. He called it the weapon of the aliens that they had developed from something related to this research. He told me that this scientist, Dr. Andropov, had never spoken publicly about it he had never used his real name because he'd been living in one of these Soviet cities that wasn't found on any map working on really secret stuff. And he said that the Russians had built satellites up there specifically to look for UFOs. And he said the American government had, I forget what the number is, but we had satellite systems specifically designed to look for UFOs coming in and out of the atmosphere. He said, you guys have been seeing these since the 40s and 50s or whenever you put up the first satellites. And so he, again, was another guy who was confirming a lot of what we know, what we suspect about the U.S. government was real. They showed me, uh, then, I, then I got him on a third guy who is an active officer. Uh, he was a, a, an intelligence officer who was running the, the study of UFOs after Colonel Sokolov ended. I met him, I mean, it was a scene right out of a Hollywood movie. I met him in an alleyway, and he's got a trench coat on, carrying a briefcase full of UFO secrets which we were able to obtain. He told me about a study called Thread 3, an ongoing UFO study, and it seemed to have, uh, it collected UFO information from all over the world, MJ-12 documents, things that, um, documentaries and reports about Area 51. The Russians had this massive collection process, putting it all together, and they analyzed it uh, and, and reached the conclusions that there are visitors from outer space, they interact with us on a regular basis. Uh, as far as we know, they're not a direct threat. However, there are cases where they have demonstrated their abilities. If they wanted to threaten us, they could. This goes back to Colonel Sokolov, something that he had told me about an incident in the Ukraine at an ICBM base. It was one of the most dramatic cases that his office investigated. It was in 1982. UFOs appeared over this Russian base. They were seen for a period of four hours. Uh, there were dozens of officers, uh, majors, captains, and above, who gave witness statements. Th there was one gigantic craft, and then there were a lot of smaller craft. These things were dancing around over the base. They would merge together and split apart, performing manu maneuvers that we couldn't do. And then after about four hours, the mission control center for this Russian ICBM base, it was taken over. The control panel lit up. Someone, something, entered the launch codes to these missiles. The guys are going crazy. They're trying to turn it off, pull the plug, stop it, and they couldn't. The missiles were enabled. They're ready to launch. It would have been the beginning of World War III. And then, poof, in an instant, the UFOs went away. The mission control panel went back to normal, and uh, the Russians were really perplexed. In the days, right immediately, Colonel Sokolov gets the report. He sends a team. 
to investigate. They couldn't find anything wrong with the control panel. It had never happened before. It had never happened since. They concluded, and they even wrote in a report, that the UFOs were demonstrating, uh, they were making a point. These may be your most powerful weapon systems, but they don't impress us. We can control them anytime we want. They were pretty upset by it. So let's start to wrap it up. <clears throat> From all of the things that you've investigated throughout the years, what is your opinion on the visitors? What do they want? Who are they? Why are they here? Sadly, I don't think we're any closer at all to answering any of the big questions. We have a lot more information. We have a lot more cases. Um, we think we have a better understanding of it. But the fact is, we have no idea uh, how to answer any of the big questions. We don't know where they're from. Uh, we don't know if they're from other planets or from other dimensions or they're time travelers. We don't know. We don't know what their interest is in us. We've got some ideas of what, what they're interested in, but ultimately we have no idea where they're from, why they're here, what their long-term intentions are. And for it's 60 years now since the modern UFO era began, and we're no closer at all to answering the big questions. The fact is that the true architects of the secrecy It's not just our government or your government, it's the visitors. They are the ones that could make the demonstration, they could land on the White House lawn if they wanted to. They don't. Instead, they give us these tiny glimpses of other realities as if they are leading us along, preparing us slowly over time uh, to, to realize that the nature of reality itself is far different from what we suspect. Uh, I, I don't know that we're going to have any answers in my lifetime. They don't seem to have any interest in making it clear to us uh, in an instant what, what's going on. And it's sad. It's, uh, it's unsettling to some degree to, to think that I'm spending, I've spent 25, 30 years chasing this. Some people like Stan Friedman have spent longer, and we are no closer to answering it. And I don't know that we're ever going to get it. Thank you very much, George Neff, for coming to Copenhagen and joining us here, flying all the way from the U.S. Oh, it's terrific. Thank you. I, I'd like to stay longer. I, I, I hope I get the chance to come back. And we both do hope that you will find the answer someday. Absolutely. And let us know. Absolutely. Thank you very much, <laughs> Thank George. Thank you very much. Sure.